Recording? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone to another one of our exciting One World Game Theory seminars. Today our presenter will be a close friend of mine and a wonderful person, Yehuda John Levy. John completed his PhD at the University of Jerusalem, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he was also given a prize for his PhD work and he and I shared a room, also important to mention. John later went on to uh, postdoc in the University of Oxford and is now at the University of Glasgow, which as far as I know is still in Scotland, which is still in the UK. So John, take it away. Thank you. Yes, the University of Glasgow will continue to be in Scotland, but I'm not sure if Scotland will continue to be in the UK. Um, okay, so this, uh, this talk came out of a question that uh, Dubi Samed asked me about four years ago. And uh, in some ways, the, the answer is uh, not, not very exciting in the sense that it's sort of expected, but there are a couple of bumps along the way that you know, I found exciting in a purely mathematical sense. And I've actually, I've put some of those in this little section at the end here that I've called technical. And actually part of the, the reason I presented technical is I'm, I'm hoping someone will show me a quicker way of doing these things that, that took up a lot of time. Um, and most of the, the talk, these parts here, you see these the Bayesian games background, the, this thing called relations. I could have given the entire talk without them, but they're to give some context of previous results. Also, a lot of results of Zeeves um, and some of mine in Zeeves. And uh, okay, so without further ado, <clears throat> uh, so but as the title is Bayesian games. So there's the Reverend Thomas Bayes and Harshani, who started uh, the whole Games of Incomplete Information Game Theory. And what we're looking at is there's this problem of extending the existence of Bayesian equilibrium to wider and wider classes of games. So by that, I mean games with a continuum of states. So games uh, with finitely many possible states of the world is a easy corollary of... Uh, of Nash's theorem by going over to the the agent the normal agent form. See, everyone's turned their screen dark, so I assume people are still there. And uh, if you have a discrete state space, uh, then you can uh, use some generalization of of uh, Brouwer's theorem. Yeah, you and know, what's the infinite dimensional one? A shouter or something. Um, or Glicksberg's fixed point theorem, I think, um, to get uh, equilibrium or do some approximation by finitely many states or something. So the problem is when you have a continuum, and for for those who, who don't remember, I'll recall some of the classes we do know, but they're they're very simple in a sense, and there are a lot of very simple structures of information structures where we don't know equilibrium exists. Yes, really, you know, shockingly simple that, uh, you know, it's almost embarrassing that we, we can't say anything about it. So I'll, I'll recall some of those what I'm alluding to. Now, some of the games that don't have equilibria, and we have such examples going back to Bob Simon, who I guess is down the hall from you, Galit, or at least his office is down the hall from you. Oh, there he is. There's Bob. Hi, Bob. Um, and uh, then uh, Zeev has, uh, has a strengthening of that example. Um, these are games without equilibria, or to be more precise, games without measurable equilibria that naturally break down into many, many components, each one of which has an equilibria. So by this, I mean each of those components is common knowledge in the sense that when we're in it, I know when we're in it, and I know that everyone else knows that we're in it, and I know that everyone else knows that everyone knows that, and that we're in it, and so on. And as a result, each component is a completely kosher game in and of itself, and each of these games has an equilibrium, and somehow you can't piece them together measurably. And uh, so the, the, those are these, uh, yeah, Bob Simon there, and, and Zeev, 
and there are two papers. I have somehow the dates on these seem wrong. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why I wrote the dates wrong, but there's the there's Zeev's actually I think should be 2014 maybe, and mine are 2000. Mine is 16, 2016. 16. And these, I don't know why these dates are wrong, but there's there's the one there's the example by Zeev, and then we have two follow up papers. Um, and uh, what we're going to, those games that were studied um, have the property that each of these components we, the game is divided to is countable. So you have the big continuum, but then each individual component is at most countable. And so I like to think of them as uh, you have the big ocean and then you have those uh, floating things in it that are connected by the rope to keep people or whatever in a certain area. So each component is like, just one of those discrete things inside this huge continuum. And here, this paper is going to discuss that jump from components to the global in a more general framework where we don't assume that each component is countable. So just so it's clear what we're talking about. So Bayesian games in the Uman sense has a, a finite set of players. And there's some set of states of the world, which we assume to be a Polish space, meaning a completely measurable, um, a com completely measurable, separable space. We assume everyone has some knowledge sigma algebra, uh, which is generated by a Borel function, incountably generated. So in other words, some fun uh, each player has, um, for each player, I can build a function that goes from states of the world to some space that's that's considered his types. And when I'm, um, he can't differentiate between states that are, that go to the same type. So that function generates the sigma algebra with the interpretation at two sets, uh, two, he can't differentiate between two states if any element of the sigma algebra that contains one contains the other. And of course, we have payoffs that assign to each state of the world and each action profile. Um, did I forget to write the actions? Yeah, I forgot the bullet point action. So everyone has an action space also, xi for player i, which we assume is a Borel function and it's continuous in each player's action. So for fixed state of the world and fixed action profile of everyone else, it's continuous. I will have one slide later where I'll discuss what happens if you drop that continuity and just assume jointly Borel, but otherwise we'll assume that. And uh, we have some fixed prior say over the set of states of the world. You can relax a lot of these assumptions in the results, for example, the state space, which I'll generally assume to be compact, can, can be less than compact, can be locally compact separable. Um, it can depend on the state, so different states can have different actions available. But those those aren't those have some interesting mathematical difficulties that aren't that aren't conceptually difficult. And I'll just remark some may be familiar, more familiar, and I've presented this talk before that way, where instead of the states of the world, you have type spaces for each player, and you can go back and forth between those models up to some measurability details by just saying the states of the world are the product of the type spaces. So the information that the player would know in that case is his own type and FI would be the sigma algebra generated by projection onto player I's knowledge, okay, projection onto the ith coordinate. Um, a strategy for a player means it's a measurable mapping uh, that's measurable with respect to his own knowledge okay so in other words it's a mapping on the quotient space assigns to each type he can have right each element of his knowledge sigma algebra a mixed action i'll mention later also pure strategies that would of course just remove this mixture and an equilibrium is how you would think it should be right the expected payoff of a player under a given strategy profile okay so the expectations you integrate over all states and all action profiles, and you give each such state and action profile the measure it deserves, right? The states are distributed according to P, and then the, the actions distribute according to each player's um, 
choice of uh, mixed strategy. And that should be at least as much as if the player deviates to any other state, uh, to any other strategy, sorry. So if he changes his strategy from sigma j to sigma prime, shouldn't do any better. And alter an alternative way, which in this case works out to be the same, is you would assume that each player would be um, responding at almost every type to his beliefs. So if you have uh, the prior, you can also get, again, up to some measurability details that's not necessary to get into for each type of a player, right? Each, each thing he knows, you, he can give his posterior on the types of the other players. And then you would say the strategy should take, uh, I, I look at the expected payoff he gets at that type. So it would be integrating not according to P, but according to his posterior, given his type, the, that payoff should be better than what well, he can get deviating to anything else. And I would require that for each, each posterior, each type of his. So those work out to be the same in the case of exact equilibria, but in the literature, Ziv and I have, like Ziv and I do in some of the papers, you can also discuss epsilon equilibria, and you'd think, okay, well, isn't that the same? I just require each player to be doing uh, as well as he can do up to epsilon for each type. That might be stronger than you want. You can have a notion of, on average, I do as well as I can do up to epsilon, but maybe there are some states where I allow myself to do very poorly. So uh, that's why I've written here um, Harshani, because of this, this notion of the average in some parts of the literature is called Harshani, while best replying at each type is is would be called Bayesian. And if you're talking about exact equilibria, they're the same, but if you're talking about epsilon equilibria, they're not. Okay, giving a, a lot of context here, background in the talk as well. So uh, Milgram and Weber have the first seminal result where they look at the case where the players have these type spaces and the prior is uh, is a product measure, meaning it, their their types are independent, or at least that it's absolutely continuous with respect to uh, product measure. So that uh, that's good, but it automatically eliminates a lot of very natural type spaces. So, for example, we don't even know. Um, suppose uh, Ziv, Galit, and I are playing, and Ziv and I commonly know something, but Galit isn't told anything. So that does not satisfy this assumption. Um, seems to be a very simple structure, and yet we have no, no idea whether Bayesian equilibrium exists in that case. Um, yeah, uh, now the, the games, like the one that Ziv and I in the subsequent papers satisfied game each player's type is finitely supported or at least countably supported, meaning that each atom of this knowledge sigma algebra is a finite or countable set. So when the player gets his information, he knows that there are only finitely many or countably many states of the world that we can be in. And that's very limiting. So we've gotten a lot of good examples of it and a lot of good results with nice papers and all, but it's, it's, clearly very lim limiting. You wouldn't expect that out of this whole continuum, I get one piece of information that will always let me know up to finitely many or discreetly many which states of the world I'm in. So that's what we want to break free from here. And just mentioning the example, so Bob Simon has a uh, three-player game. Types are finitely supported, as I think, I think to each type has support two correctly. Um, so each when a player learns his type, he knows that there are two possible states of the world he could be in, and it has no measurable Bayesian equilibrium. And then Ziv extent makes the sharper as two-player Bayesian game finally many supports, and there isn't even an epsilon Bayesian equilibrium. So that's Bayesian equilibrium in the in the strong sense of Epsilon best replying at each type. Uh, so why do we always say measurability? 
uh, this audience uh, probably is from, familiar with the importance. I've given it to audiences where it may be less important, but I'll dedicate one slide to it nonetheless, that uh, how do you get the measurable functions? You say continuous functions are too limiting. So let me close the family of continuous functions point-wise. So now I have, for example, step functions because step functions I can do continuous functions with sharper and sharper steps and then point-wise limit I get a step. So I can do here lots of things that I couldn't do before. And then I make sure that family is closed under point-wise convergence and so on with some induction argument. And I get a family of all the Borel measurable functions. I get, um, I can extend that to Lebesgue measurable functions, which are Borel up to measure zero. So they're almost everywhere Borel. And I get the Borel sets. I just take the indicator function of the set. Yes, one if I'm in the set zero. Otherwise, if that's a Borel function and it's a Borel measurable set, similarly for Lebesgue. So that's, see, when you start playing around with it, you see that that's a very far reaching generalization. But on the other hand, Borel functions, and again, up to measure zero, Lebesgue functions actually behave a lot like continuous functions. So Littlewood's principles are that every measurable function is, um, eh, sorry, every measurable set is almost the, the union of finite many, finitely many intervals in an appropriate sense. And every function of class LP, which means measure, measurable together with some bound on integral is almost continuous. And every convergent sequence of functions, pointwise convergence is almost uniformly convergent. So there's always ways to take out small sets of measure zero to make th these things true. So it's far reaching generalization, but that uh, they're also surprisingly down to earth. And what I haven't written here is that you always want your things to be measurable because things that aren't measurable are very weird, especially if you want non Lebesgue measurable and you can't, uh, for instance, you may not be able to integrate. So if I were to give non-measurable strategies in the game and then I would ask a natural question, like what's the probability that um, such and such players playing left, I wouldn't be able to give a coherent answer to this. So, <clears throat> to give some context uh, to what uh, what Bob and Ziv and others did and to, to motivate what we're trying to break free from, let's imagine the states of the world are laid out. Uh, there's no particular significance to them being in the same row or same column here. Um, you could just draw, just imagine they're, they're just spread out. You just threw out a bunch of uh, current cardinals like you're feeding a chicken and there, they're all spread out. Then I think, okay, let's look at this state of the world in the middle. Player one at this state is unable to differentiate between these three um, states. Okay. But he knows we're at least one of these three. But he thinks where might player two think we are. So player two, at this state, player two thinks we could be here or here. And player two... Here, player two thinks we can be here or here, and here, player two thinks he could be here or here. So player one has to account for what's happening at all six of these states. Because for all he knows, even though we're really here, he thinks we could be here, and then he knows player two might think we're here. So he has to account for what player two is doing here. And similarly, um, since player two at, uh, sorry, since player one at this state might think we're here, player two at either of these states will consider what player one does here. So therefore back at the original state, player one has to consider what we do up here because he thinks that we could be at a state where player two thinks it's important what player one did back here and so on. So if you continue this process of closing the states of the world at the point you started at under the player's knowledge, you get what's called a common knowledge component. So after you finish this process, recursively you're you have a set such that at every point in that set each player knows we're in the set and everyone knows we're at that set and so on so you will only consider the actions of those states when you're considering what should i do here how can we make an equilibrium profile here and this leads naturally to um a concept that's been studied a lot in descriptive set theory it's sort of the the bastard child of topology and logic, 
which is countable Borel equivalence relationship. So a relationship on a standard Borel space, standard Borel means uh, essentially a Polish space up to a uh, up to a Borel mapping. So think of the unit interval or anything that you can map it uh, isomorph in a Borel isomorphic way. Um, is a relationship uh, which itself is a Borel subset of the product. And a countable Borel equivalence relationship is one that, first of all, it's an equivalence relationship. Yeah. So what that means for relationship, you know, transitive and reflexive and symmetric and all that. And that each equivalence class is countable. So our, from Bayesian games, we now from this slide have an example, the common knowledge equivalence relation. Um, so if each player's type is finitely or countably supported, you can see that each class the, the class I get from doing this recursively is also countable. So I naturally get uh, CBER, the acronym they use, um, when I'm talking about Bayesian games with finite or countably supported types. And these have been studied a lot in descriptive set theory. So what are some weird things that can happen? So probably the most basic weird thing is a variation on the first example everyone sees of a non-measurable set i have i'm typing on my infinite typewriter doubly infinite so it's strings that go this way and that way but i only type two bits okay all the other keys are broken so i just type a's and b's or something and i say to myself okay i can produce every possible doubly infinite string but i want to choose a representative of each class what do i mean by class if if two strings are the same up to shifting one over, I, I don't want to take both. I want to take exactly one representative of that class. And that's called a transversal. And one of the things, um, it's, not hard to, it's not hard to show, I won't do it here, you can see it in, in any textbook uh, that touches and you know, look in Kekros' classical descriptive set theory, you'll see, is that there does not exist a Borel or even a Lebeg transversal okay so any set that i know by the axiom of choice there is such a set uh, but i it would necessarily have to be an extremely weird set um and the banach tarski paradox uh also does something similar to this yes that's the paradox that takes a ball breaks it down to a bunch of pieces and puts them back together so i get two balls of the same volume as the each of them is has the same volume as the original one. And the way it does that is by building sets that don't have a well-defined volume using the axiom of choice by choosing one element from each class where the classes are defined in a certain way. So I, th I think Bob has a paper uh, linking Banach-Tarski paradoxes uh, to game theory more explicitly. Uh, here's another paradox you get. This is this I have always find this one cute. So very basic um, graph theory claim that you could give you know, first first discrete math course. So in a cyclic graph, which is just a fancy way of saying a bunch of trees. Okay, each connected component is a tree in that case. As a tree is a connected a cyclic graph, so this is just a collection of those, can be colored with only two colors, whereby colored, I of course mean that no two vertices are touching each other. And the way you do that is simple. You come to one component, you choose a point and call it the root. By the way, do people see my cursor as well? Yeah, okay. Um, so you choose one point and call it the root and call it white, and you call it each of its neighbors black. And then you call each of those neighbors that hasn't been colored white. And you keep on doing that. And since there are no cycles, you'll never run into trouble coming back to something that you've, you've already colored. So you can just keep going outward from the route you've chosen. And you do that with one component, you do with the next component, and you do with the next component until you're all finished. Now, what if I want the coloring to be Borel? Okay, so I assume I have a continuum of uh, states, uh, continuum of vertices. Um, and I want the coloring to be done in a Borel way. 
Um, so I wanted to map vertices to some space of colors. Of course, I said no two adjacent vertices are the same color. Um, so interestingly, um, it can be shown, uh, there are actually several examples I discussed in that paper, that you can do a Borel graph on a, so you start with a continuum and you can define a Borel graph with countable degree. So um, you have uh, the edge relationship is Borel, right? The question of which two points are connected by an edge is a Borel subset of the product of vertices with itself. Each vertice has at most countable degree. Therefore, each component has, by induction, each component has countable has countably many vertices. And yet you cannot color this tree with even countably many colors. So you need a continuum of colors to be able to color that tree. So if you try to apply the algorithm I described earlier there by choosing a point in each component to be the root, you run into a problem there already because you can't measurably choose one point from each component necessarily. So someone could say, okay, that fails, but maybe there's some, some other way to, to start it or to you know somehow to prove it. Yeah? Just because it doesn't work one way doesn't mean it never works. Um, indeed, it's not hard to see in the previous example here that if I, I def if I define two points to be connected, if they're achieved by moving one over left or right, so each each vertex has degree two, and it, it's not too hard to see. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise that you can you can color it with three colors. I'm not sure if you can. Do, I think you can't do it with two. I'd be surprised, but you could definitely do it with three. Um, but here they they do a different construction and they show that you cannot do it with countably many color at all. You need colors to all you continuum with a continuum. Of course, it's easy. Just give every point its same its same color. Yes, it's, it's like the joke of how you get how to get peace in the Middle East. Just give everyone their own country. Okay, now in. And uh, the third example, which I'm not pre presenting explicitly, is um, in the Simon example, the Helmholtz example, the common knowledge relation is a countable Borel equivalence relation. And that, and you have equilibria on each component separately because each component is countable, but you cannot um, piece them all um, together measurably. Okay, so that's the, that's a sort of trick building them um, with a lot of creativity going into how you how you actually make it so that they can't be chosen measurably. So all these paradoxes disappear if you when you look at the following property of a relation. So an equivalence relation on a polar space is said to be smooth. And this is a horrible name because we're used to smooth like functions being differentiable, continuously differentiable, and then somehow it comes in here. But its use in this descriptive set theory context is older than I am. So it, it's kind of hard to, to argue against it. It says to be smooth if there's some other polar space and a Borel mapping to it, such that the classes of this relation are exactly the level sets of the function. So for example, it'll be clearer in Rn, um, let me say two elements are in the same class, if and only if the difference between them is on the integer lattice. Okay, so this relationship, as if it's maybe easier to think about it when n equals one at first, right? The difference. which gives me the integer part, uh, sorry, the non-integer part, um, or in the case of Rn, the non-integer part of each component is, um, John, we're losing is a mapping your... which uh, satisfies this, okay? so. Two elements are in the integer part mapping. John, John, we're, we're having difficulty Hello? here. Yeah, we, we lost my contact. connection. 
you're having you, difficulty here. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Back up a bit and, and repeat the last few sentences again. Okay. Yeah, that's the uh, these old Glasgow buildings. Internet, yes, it's not quite uh, not quite up. There. So, um, where where did you stop hearing? So in R N, I define uh, I can define a relation to points are in the same class if the difference between them is on the integer lattice, uh, and the function that realizes this is the function which returns for each component the non-integer part. So if you have a relationship like that, it means that the, um, the image of the function that realizes it is uh, a nice set. Um, so a way you can think of being smooth is if, you're, if the set of classes can be given nice names. Okay, so if I go back to this one here, uh, for example, that what... What this proposition is saying is that there's no way to give a, um, each class of this relationship a nice name other than saying the class that contains this infinite string. Okay, no, so you think of it as a naming way, and this uh, this says that the the classes form what's called an analytic or Suslin set. So. Um, or Lebeg famously uh, made a mistake and, and thought he'd proven that the image of a Borel set under a Borel function is a Borel set as well. And it turns out to be wrong. And that was noticed by Suslin, who was a student of Novikov, I think. Um, and, but analytic sets are almost as nice as Borel sets. Okay, They, they have some more oddities. Their biggest problem is that they're not closed under complement, so the complement of an analytic set needn't be analytic. But uh, other than that, they're, they're reasonable. In fact, you have to work a little hard to find an analytic set, which is not Borel. It doesn't come naturally. And uh, what Ziv and I proved in one of our papers whose date I, I see, actually, I'm not sure if this date is correct either. Was it 18 or 17? Uh, it was it was um, seventeen. It was definitely 20, 17, 2017. Okay, I don't know why why all the dates here are wrong for some reason, but um, so that we said you take any Bayesian games with finitely supported types, like we like I showed you in that picture, in which the common knowledge relation is smooth, meaning uh, satis meaning is the level sets of some Borel function like this. Then there necessarily exists a measurable, Bay measurable Bayesian equilibrium in the game. Okay, so that property, which also works in descriptive set theory, also comes in handy here. And just to not get confused, this is Suslin, who died tragically young from typhus. And that's not to be confused with the Suslik, which is a cute Eurasian squirrel like creature. Okay, so now. Let's go um, to our context. So a benchmark that might help you to have in mind, and then I'll state the, uh, my main results, both for game in general and for this benchmark, is think of the case where the, in, the states of the world can be written as a product of the public information along with types for each players that are privately known. So I purposely write them as T prime because type of I would usually include all his information. And here I'm saying, no, it's just the private part. Maybe I should have wrote this T subscript P for private. That might've been better. So um, the, in this case, um, if I partition it into sets of this form, with class of this form, this is clearly a smooth relationship because then the projection to the first coordinate is the mapping which shows that project that that it's smooth, right? The the name of a class is its public knowledge. Okay, and does this, this relate to the Milgram, you... Milgram uh, and Weber? Uh, you could. So it would be a a particular case of of Milgram and Weber. So there, I would have to say that the type of each player is the product of the public knowledge 
with the private, and I'm only looking at the case where they all have the same public knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. And note that I don't in general assume that each common knowledge component looks like this. I assume that each such set is common knowledge when you're in it, but it could divide further into further common knowledge subclasses. So keep this example in mind and let me state the result and I'll give you some examples both in and out of this benchmark case. So the, and the case you should be thinking about is we're assuming that once people see the public knowledge, then an equilibrium exists. So for each pub piece of public knowledge they get, they can find an equilibrium. And what I wanna show is that they can have an equilibrium ex ante before they see this. So if you think of equilibrium as a big book of instructions of what to do with each piece of information you get, this is telling, I'm assuming that given the public knowledge, they can write a little book about what to do on any private information they may get from there on. And I'm saying they could each, they'll be able to each write a big book um, which says what they should do given any information, any public information and private information that they're going to receive now. So to state the general result, both out of the benchmark and in the benchmark, I'm not sure which is clearer. I've gone back and forth in presentations um, on, on which to say that it is, but I've strategically decided here to first state it generally. So put the benchmark aside a second, but not far, keep it in mind. You have a prior over your states of the world. You have some Borel function to some other state, which coarsens the common knowledge relation. Okay, so you're saying that there's a relation which coarsens the common knowledge relation, which is smooth. Okay, and you assume that on each point in the, or almost every point in the image of this psi, if you look at the game that you get conditional on C giving that value, you have an equilibrium. Then I claim that you can get an equilibrium on the entire space. So you can piece together the equilibrium you get for each of those Y's onto an equilibrium of the entire space. And similarly, if you replace equilibrium with pure equilibrium, you know you have a pure equilibrium on each, then you can get a pure equilibrium on everything. And in the particular um, benchmark case, I don't need to assume smoothness because I already have that that relation is smooth. It's saying that if on almost every public signal, in other words, the players have the posterior that results after that public signal, if I know I have an equilibrium, then I can put them together in an equilibrium on everything. Okay, so let's see some examples of that. So if there's only public information, then basically what I'm looking at is a collection of just strategic form games. There's something announced and then we know everything. There's no private information. So an, equ an equilibrium existing in each game is enough to piece them together for the entire game. Now, as you can guess, you didn't need me for that. That's something that's a standard technique um, that you know, been used for for ages and ages. Um, another case in my eyes, let's say on each public signal, conditional on public signal, um, each um, each posterior is a product. Okay, so it may be uh, that for that this public signal gives you the uh, mean of some. Um, normal distributions, um, and that mean may be correlated among the players, but once that public knowledge is revealed, the posterior is just a product of, of normal distributions, each type. So in that case, I know that equilibrium exists condition on each T0 because of Milgram-Weber. And then I can, I can, I say I, they can be pieced all together measurably. And a particular case of that, I'll explain why I mentioned, is look at the case where the private knowledge of the first n minus one players is nothing, but player n could have some private knowledge. So this is the case where the first n minus one no 
the same and n knows that and more. So that's a particular case of number two here, right? Because the it's obviously a product because it, it, it's it, it's concentrated on a singleton on the n minus one first ones. And I I mentioned this one explicitly because this is this case for two players is proven in a paper by Stinchcom and White, um, which is a very nice paper that discusses things other than Bayesian games as well. So you should look that up. But um, we get it. We get it in as a particular case here. And going back to the general states of the world, it doesn't have to be the benchmark case. Imagine, for example, that the set of space set of states of the world is R squared with some prior. And what's publicly revealed is the sum of those two. So two people are sharing a pot of money and the total amount they get is revealed, but there's they don't know, they may have some additional belief or something about how it's split. Um, and conditional on each possible sum, somehow I know equilibrium exists. So that function, which gives the sum, um, it makes this uh, common knowledge relationship a smooth one, or, or at least a relationship which, which coarsens the common knowledge and makes it a smooth one. And therefore, I can piece it all together and say equilibrium exists. That's, um, and obviously, if someone has a more natural example, please email me. So what's the, uh, so first Sorry, let uh, me give, yeah. Uh, good question. So if I get this right, so to get the common knowledge components from your setting, you take this assumption that all the uh, sub-sigma algebra of so prime information are generated by Borel functions. So this gives you equivalence relation that you take the transitive closure, or how does this work? Yeah, the common knowledge relationship results from the player's individual knowledge by taking the transitive closure. So in ter if I look at the player's sigma algebra, the, their knowledge sigma algebra is the common knowledge. Sigma algebra would be the um, strongest sigma algebra that coarsens all of them. Okay, and you can do this because you have functions that give you these types, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, here's a, a little remark uh, before I, I very briefly describe the technique that I use. I say I won't probably have time to get to the technical part, although people can stay on. Um, a little remark here is that, I, as I said, I might consider dropping continuity from the um, assumptions because I'm already assuming that equilibrium exists on each component. So usually you think of continuity as being needed to assume equilibrium exists. What if I assume I already have it? And let me look even in the simplest case where I have only public information. So I'm looking at just a collection of games and I'm assuming my payoff is jointly Borel in state and payoffs. And I assume an equilibrium exists in each game, so I don't need um, I don't need the continuity to assume to show that that uh, equilibrium exists in each game. Can I from this can I piece it together? And it turns out interesting enough that the answer uh, that the statement that equilibrium sorry that equilibrium exists under this setup under the setup is independent of ZFC. So it's one of those statements that you can neither prove nor disprove from the usual axioms of math. Um, so certainly if I, if I don't assume only public info, I assume that the, the information is more complex. And of course I have, I have no chance of assuming, of proving um, equilibrium exists on everything without adding some axiom, at least without adding some axiom to ZFC, uh, it is interesting to think if I, if I, is there an axiom I can add to ZFC that would guarantee me equilibrium, not only in the public information case, um, not sure. So what's a, what would be a common technique just to give a taste of, of what I do here? What would, what would be the, the, What's a common technique, for instance, that's done in the collection of games case? 
first you show that each game has an equilibrium. You use whatever compactness and continuity assumptions you've assumed in your particular case. You show that the correspondence which assigns to each game its equilibrium profile is measurable in some sense, measurable Borel graph or analytic graph or something. And then you would apply some measurable selection theorem like the von neumann umann theorem. So this is a collection of theorems you can find in the literature that all have the form of if you have a correspondence between spaces that satisfy such and such niceness, and the correspondence satisfies also such and such niceness, then you have a function which, which chooses out of the correspondence. So instead of for each thing in the domain giving a bunch, it chooses one, and it chooses one inside what the correspondence would have dictated, and that this selector is nice enough. So whatever type of measurability you wanted it to satisfy. So what, you can try to take a naive approach like that here. You can say to yourself, okay, for each public signal, let's look at the benchmark case here for simplicity. Let this, um, let me define a correspondence. Sorry, I didn't, I said this should be, let this be the equilibrium correspondence. Somehow the be the equilibrium correspondence is missing. So here I view the strategies as, Borel functions from their types to um, to um, mixed actions. Okay, so for each public signal, I choose a function for player i from his types to mixed actions, and I want that when this profile should be in equilibrium in that given that public information. So I've reduced to a smaller game where I know public information. I'm ignoring anything that has public information different than T0. And I find the equilibrium there. And then I want to piece them together using whatever nice uh, measurable selection theorem. So that would be the naive approach. And the problem is that the space of just measurable functions doesn't have a separable topology on it. Okay, and in general, a, a space of functions on uncountable space doesn't have a natural topology that makes it separable. Now, that sounds like a whiny little mathematical condition that shouldn't really bother us, but it turns out that, that it's really important here. And I refer you, for example, to this nice uh, Kahn and Rusukini paper. It was a book chapter, I think, actually. And the title says it all, Some Unpleasant Objects in Non-Separable Hilbert Spaces. So when you drop, when you drop that separability, you get some some very odd things. So it, it's more than just a technical difficulty. It really shatters your whole use of measurable tools. So the, the idea that I want to do is I want to go over to what's called distributional strategies. So let me quickly remind everyone what the weak topology of probability measures is. So there's a topology on the space of measures on a, on a continuum, on a separable metric space which uh, has the property, it's almost a definition, but you'd need to assume it's measurable to, have, to make this a definition, um, has the property that a sequence of measures converges in this space if for every continuous function, these integrals converge. So let me maybe, out of shortness of time, I'll also jump to the picture. We would, you'd want to say that these uh. curves Sorry, did someone say something? So you'd want to sh you'd want these measures to converge to a point mass. Now, if you're using too strong a notion of convergence, then you would say to yourself, they can't converge to a point mass because um, each of these gives the point mass measure zero. So if you're using the total variation distance, for example, then you don't have convergence there. But if if I use the weak convergence, then they do converge to a point mass because clearly if I take a continuous function and I integrate it with respect to sharper and sharper distributions, those are going to converge just the value of the function at that point. Um, similarly, if you take a, a mass like this, a sequence like this, so the first one has puts its mass on five points, giving each probability point two, 
And the second one is spread more finely. So on 10 points, each of which get probably 0.1. And the next one is on 20 points, each of which gets probably 0.05 and, and so on. These will converge to the uniform distribution. Even though, again, in some notion of distance, the uniform distribution is, is far away because it, it gives each finite set probability zero. But if, again, again, if you apply the definition and you see that, that it works. Someone, someone singing, just applying a, a background to my. Uh... Um, so I want to go over to distributional strategies, which have been used at a few points in the literature, including in Milgram and Weber's paper. So uh, for each player, I, I call his information TI his type. So that's the quotient space. Those are the collections of information you can have. And a behavioral strategy, so that's, a, that's our usual strategies, that maps from his types to mixed actions, together with a prior on that space, give me a distributional strategy, which is just the measure on the product of types and actions. Okay, so a distributional strategy means that instead of... Um, I mean, it means that uh, in probability terms, it means suppose I let a type be chosen and then a and then the action chosen according to the strategy or the mixed action chosen according to strategy and randomizing. I'll if I do that many, many times, I'll get some sort of scatter plot over Ti times Xi. And I take that scatter plot to be the probability distribution, the end. That's the end result. I call that my distributional strategy. So a distributional strategy, of course, can then go back to give me a prior just by taking the projection to TI. And um, I can also then extract from it the strategy up to measure zero. So... A behavioral strategy and a prior give me a distributional, a distributional give me a prior and many st uh, behavioral strategies. And it's sort of that shrinking down of them that makes the space of distributional strategies separable because this space with the weak topology is separable. So, and not surprisingly, an equilibrium in behavioral strategies goes back and forth with an equilibrium in distributional strategies. Okay, Stinchcomb and Simon, you do something similar, but for two players in the nested setup where one player knows more than the other, so they avoid most of the technical difficulties. So what I do, and I guess this will be the last slide um, people can stay to discuss the technical. So what I do is I show that each class, meaning given each piece of public information has an equilibrium. I show that the correspondence from classes to equilibria, so the correspondence which says for this um, class you're in, these are your equilibria, is analytic, okay? This is equilibria in distributional strategies, not the behavioral distributional strategies with the, with the weak topology on them. I show that this is an analytic graph, and then I use an appropriate measurable selection theorem to choose one distributional strategy equilibrium from each class. And I show that when, when you piece together distributional strategy in such a way, you get a distributional equilibrium on the whole thing. In other words, with your original prior, and then you can translate that back into a behavioral strategy. So there's a lot of technical work involved. Okay, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yes, yay me, I did all the technical work. Um, and one of the main, most difficult components that I really struggled with for a long time is how you combine distributional strategies in a measurable way. So I give you a pro if I give you a profile of distributional strategies, it's easy to see that these induce a measure on on everything, on the product of uh, states of nature and types and mixed actions in a Borel way. By the way, at some point, my actions went from XI to AI. Go with it. Um, so you need to show that the, by correct way, I mean that you, uh, that, uh, you have the correct joint distribution 
on states of the world and types, and that you, you sort of don't introduce any correlations in this distribution. So you don't want when you go from here to here to introduce correlations between the actions of the players or correlating some player's action with a type that isn't his in the wrong way or so on. So there's a unique way to do that, not surprisingly, but the difficult part is to show that the mapping that takes those and puts them together is a Borel mapping. Um, so it sounds innocuous, but it, it took quite a bit of work. And maybe if someone has an easier way or knows a reference. So to sum up, so in many models, Bayesian games partition into games with a uh, into a continuum of games, each of which has a smaller state space. And in general, as we know from Bob and Zeev, that it may not be possible to piece them together in a measurable way. Um, but with the countable common knowledge components, we've known that smoothness of the common knowledge relationship was the way to solve it. And what we show more generally is that equilibria on components, which result from a smooth relationship, can give a global equilibrium. So it's actually a generalization in two ways. We're not assuming the components are countable, and we're also not assuming the components you've gotten down to are the common knowledge ones. So you can divide into components in such a way such that each one has many, maybe many common knowledge components. You don't need to go all the way down to the bare bones. And the key is to use distributional strategy on each component and to do a sort of back and forth. And in addition to the typical steps, we've had to develop some new measure theoretical claims, which they must be demonstrated. I put must in question mark because I'm wondering if it can be whittled down to something simpler, but we'll leave it at that. Okay, very good. Thank you, John. Are there questions from the audience? I hope no one fell asleep. That would be very rude. <laughs> oh, hi, Marilyn. Hi. Yes. I, I assume that all goes through with correlated equilibrium with public with public correlated equilibrium. Yes, but for correlated equilibrium, you get it anyway. You don't need smoothness, if I remember correctly. Uh, I have to double check exactly the conditions. I think there's one of the Simon, the uh, Simon Stinchcomb papers, not Bob Simon. Uh, I forget the other Simon. I think also in Austin. Uh, I think correlated equilibrium works more generally. I don't think you need any of this. I thought your question would be if you can do it for stochastic games. No, uh, 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 not for stochastic game, but the question is for, but uh, I, I couldn't find the relation how to do it for, for stationary equilibrium, yes. Uh, yeah, but you can, you can maybe, uh, so for in, in Ziv and I, one of our papers, we generalize the countable um, common knowledge components to you can do it for countable orbits. So if the orbits in the stochastic game of the continuum are countable, like in my example, but unlike my example, the relate the orbit relationship is smooth, then you can piece the equilibria together. Okay. John? Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, John, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I, I did, uh, but but um, it helped me a lot to understand it better now that I listened to it the second time. Um, you mentioned in the beginning uh, epsilon equilibria, several versions thereof. Um, yeah. So does your theorem go through uh, for any of these versions? Uh, good question. Um... I would, uh, I'm pretty sure it would go through for the, uh, I'm pretty sure we'd go through for either of them. Let's see. Um, you know what, let me get back to you. I don't want to, I don't want to say something stupid. My gut feeling is it would, it would go for either of them, either for the, the weaker on average up to epsilon or the stronger everyone, but let me think about it and get drop you an email. Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot.
Floor is open for more questions. Don't be shy. John is willing yes, while to you're finish. thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll relate the fun, funny haha story in that when I gave this talk in Maastricht uh, two months ago, I was checking my email at lunch three hours before the talk and saw that the paper had been rejected from TE because they thought it didn't appeal to the wider economic audience. I don't know why they would say that, right? Very, very simple. Uh, a question on this independence of set of C, is this something complicated like the continuum hypothesis or, or um, something simpler? Uh, so you're talking... You said the existence of an equilibrium yeah. with the com combination can neither be proved or disproved. I mean, yeah. this must be some reduction going on to some other problem of this sort. Yeah, right? so it's reducible... Uh, let, let, uh, let, let, let me uh, reinforce... Bernard's question. You say that yeah. it is that cannot be proved, cannot be disproved. Is it independent? Yeah. Is it independent? What's uh, what's the difference between independent? No, no. Uh, to, to make sure that when you say cannot be proved, cannot be disproved. Yes. I mean independent. I mean there are there are axioms yeah. you could add to ZFC that make it true. When and it's axioms consistent and when, it when it's not consistent. Okay, that's yeah. the. Main. Okay. Yeah. So the reduction, uh, the reduction, the specific reduction I use is stated less classically than it should be. So it's the claim that every function with a coordinate graph is Lebesgue measurable. If that's true, then then this is true. If that's false, it's false. And that that's a claim that's independent of ZFC. So if you have measurability assumptions like that you get from uh, analytic determinacy, then it's true. And uh, if you uh, if you have uh, assumptions um, with, uh, you know, things like the projection of co-analytic sets being non-measurable, which I think um, Gerdel already had such constructions, then it's false. Um, can I ask something about this? So are both directions relatively consistent or do you need some kind of large cardinal assumption to get this projective uh, things right? As soon as you said large cardinal, I can answer. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I did it in the most logic for dummies where you find the claim that people smarter than you have proven is independent and, and do a reduction. Okay, thank you everyone for convening today for this very interesting seminar presentation by John. And uh, we hope we can see you in future One World Game Theory seminars. Bye, Tom. You're gonna be right. You're gonna be right next to me next week. You're not even saying hello. <laughs> quiet, quiet, John. Bye. Goodbye, there. Okay. By the way, uh, Marilette, do you know? Uh,